Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld and the recording for the September 10th Cloud 2030 discussion where we talked about disaster planning and what could go wrong. So we built out this grid um, and had some amazing discussions about all sorts of interesting contingencies, things that could disrupt everything and in every possible way. And we just hit the tip of the iceberg. Great discussion. This will get you thinking. The only thing we're missing is your voice in this. Please join us at the 2030.cloud. I think that'd be I think funny. I, yeah, from an information ahead. standpoint, I think it's really important there, right? Because like, I think one of the things that's happening with information right now is everything is so bite-sized that everything is, not, nothing is taken in context. Very little is taken in context. And we are so reactive because the media folks and the PR and AR marketing folks want us to be reactive. That's what their job is, is to make us reactive. So we're so reactive to everything instead of taking a breath and pausing and coming back. So I think that's why some of the parodies of, you know, of, of all the stuff we're talking about are so funny because it forces you to see it in such an absurd context that you do have to sit back and see it all in, within context. I don't know. That's kind of my take on it from an information standpoint. Well, I think, I think there's also a growing hunger for longer form Sunday morning over coffee content. Uh, you can see it with stuff with a lot of the stuff with the Atlantic, uh, with the articles there, all that longer form stuff. For me, it was always, you know, Marshall Kirkpatrick was always the one when early, early days of read, write web when he didn't normally break stuff, but he would use it to, you know, he'd, he'd analyze it. And that kind of content is starting to come back. I see it. I see it every day. Hmm. Yeah, I, I was uh, surprised to see um, Joe Rogan's um, number of views on his uh, two plus hours talks he does with people. I was like, people are people dive, dive into sort of. It never I think, went away. It's just that, like Gina was saying, is that there was incentives for everyone to pay attention to this. Um, and the context here is that uh, one of my kids' friends is the executive editor for Slate, and I talking to her and she's like, uh, asked like, what? I thought it went away. No, it didn't go away. And, but then I reevaluated things and basically Huffington Post, Salon.com, a lot of publications that it had that were its peers over the last 10, 15 years were so focused on the bite-sized articles while Slate had always continued to be medium-sized articles, not Atlantic size, but real mm. articles versus trying to get hits. So um, continuation and but the other thing here is, and this is related to what we're doing here, is that the need for context in a little bit more in depth is why event, the event business is gonna stay. Because people still need that because you need the time away from the computer to have 30 minutes, an hour and a half to actually pay attention and absorb a, a lesson. There was, a, there was a thread we were in with with Donnie Burkholtz, um earlier in the earlier in the week on uh, just what what sort of processes are people doing? How are they adapting to take that time? Right. The th uh, it, it, what started with it started with uh, what's his face from uh, from Netflix when he came out with when he just came out with a book and it was a you know it was a line that he had in there about thinking time. Now I think he's wrong on all the work from home stuff, but his uh, his position on you've got to you've got to have carve out time to actually think mm -hmm. we well that's why i like this conversation because i don't generally sit around and think about national security of the cloud like it's not something that i like sit around and think about and then all of a sudden we start talking about it and i'm like whoa this is crazy i so i i actually do think about that you know in my role <laughs> no because it's the, it's those things that, and I'm sure yeah. I'm going to get raked over the coals on this one, but eventually we reach a point where an AW, you know, having your, having your data and, and, and all your eggs in a basket with an AWS or a Microsoft or a Google, which could, because of geopolitical reasons, get shut out of a lot of countries, right? Large markets that becomes a risk factor that people need to start thinking about uh, because 
we are no longer in a, you know, we're starting to see bifurcation of the internet and of these networks where they're, where they're starting to get walled off. And what happens when, when your clap, you know, when part of your, when part of your cloud is no longer available. So yeah, these they, they are larger. They are larger issues. It now, sort of seems realistic to me with the TikTok stuff, and, and yeah, yeah, all that all that starts to play in. Yeah, uh, you watch and you watch an Oracle, Oracle lineup uh, geopolitically around, you know, around the administration. Uh, all the all the stuff around Jedi with Microsoft and um, and Amazon. You're watching Gaia X over in uh, over in Europe. Um, uh, everything going on with China. Uh, nobody mentions Alibaba. You don't hear that much anymore, but you know there's stuff going on there. I just tweeted about that. The Wall Street Journal just ran a story this morning on uh, the top cloud providers. And when you look at Alibaba and Tencent, they actually are double where Google is. Really? I see, I had no idea. That's how American centric I am. Yeah, we don't we don't count the, when we look at the hyperscalers. We don't, you know, we always assume that it's the top two and a half. I, I put Google and a half on that one, obviously. Um, uh, but it's you know, but the others the others it's probably a top top five of hyperscalers. Top no, you know. seven. Uh, so Paul's not here today, but I was talking to Paul about this, and uh, yeah, Alibaba and Tencent. Uh, with Tencent's about I didn't see the article, but it's got. 50% of the size of Alibaba. Um, and the, but you have Oracle and IBM who aren't, have huge uh, user bases, but we don't usually talk about them because they, it's only their existing user base that they're covering. But in terms of their, their reach, it's still very significant. So um, I would say six. Um, I know we have rack space here, people here. I wouldn't include them, but. <laughs> huh. I mean, you're, start, you're starting to see it break out into different, different strata, right? You've got, you've got the five or six at, globally at the hyperscale level. We count Geo at, in India on that. No, the one, one region we don't talk about is South America, uh, whether anybody's touching that. You've got the, you know, you've got the, thin thread of you know of the alternative cloud that's that's um that's out there and i think you've i i'd argue lawrence on the you know on the oracle and the ibms i think they're probably in the most precarious position right now because they you know they're too big for a lot of companies um mm -hmm. and they're not strong enough against an aws or or an azure or an alibaba I think they're in they're in a sort of a purgatory no man's land. I I, I think the, the the one part where at, at least IBM uh, has a leg ahead of uh, uh, of or say AWS or Google, uh, possibly Oracle too. Although I, I have no experience for that, is uh, their uh, uh, data geo restriction uh, capabilities. Um, I mean that 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 was historically IBM's business, and, and, and I feel like they they were able to transfer that into their cloud offering to some degree. Um, I, I know at least when, when talking in, like in, in in financial markets and and in, in, in like online gaming, uh, there is a lot of hesitation about using the the big three at least on, on the western side. Uh, because of their lack of lack of guarantees for data data locality. Like if you, if you spin up an, an RDS instance, you don't know where the data is. Yeah, that's where that's where their his, that's where their his, their history comes into play, and that and that experience. They might not be growing as fast as everybody else, or be as attractive on that, but they're that stableness is is absolutely key because you are we are starting to get into into areas of you know areas of and issues that don't play well to newcomers right they play what they play better to people that have been there and done that and have played at a global scale for for so long 
Yeah, I, I, I would say that. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, just gonna finish this. Um, I would say that possibly the the biggest threat to IBM and on, on our Oracle Cloud are possibly private clouds. As as Rick, uh, Parker here was mentioning in chat, that they're they're a growing uh, field uh, and people who want data locality. Well, they might say, well, I might as well run my own data center. Yeah, I think yeah, the maybe... reality is the the Oracle and IBM contingent or those that are using those services are existing customers. The challenge is they're not attracting net new into the mix, um, which I think is ultimately going to lead to their downfall because as you have leakage of customers that move to other services, you essentially see the decline. But who are the customers? Are we shift attracting new customers though? That's I'm I, sorry. Question. What's that? How much is OpenShift actually in Red Hat actually <laughs> attracting new customers? And the other thing is, know. the other thing is to go along with that, right? What customers are we talking about? When you're talking about every bank and every government of the world, those are pretty big customers. Yeah, they are. But it goes beyond just financial services and um, geos. You have a lot of very large enterprises that have been IBM customers, maybe even going back to mainframe days. I can think of a uh, number of companies that I've been working with, uh, major airlines that are IBM customers, um, you know, running airline operations on a mainframe, on an IBM mainframe still to this day, um, because the switching costs are just far too great. So I think you'll still have that that long tail for the IBMs and Oracles of the world, um, mainly because frankly, I mean, Oracle's technology isn't that bad, but it, they're just a pain in the butt to deal with and bloody expensive to boot. But the, the offset there is the switching costs are just, and the risk associated with that are just, it's just too great. Um, I, I'm ex Oracle. I was trying to push cloud out at Oracle. Um, the the way we sold cloud was it was not cloud you know so you buy cloud in bulk you know i never heard about that like working at rackspace and vmware previously you know um that's not cloud you know you don't buy cloud in bulk and if it was like annually you use it or lose it like what <laughs> so uh, cloud is by the drip and uh, it, it's the how you go to the market matters as well and technology in, yeah, as Timmy, as you said, it, it's not that bad. That means it is kind of a little bit bad, but not that bad. The API first uh, sort of thinking and and developer advocacy groups are missing from these vendors, it, almost missing, I will say. It, it it's crazy. And I, I always say that if you if you are if your proximity to developers is bad, you are in deep shit. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and the funny thing is, I don't know that I agree with that, that statement, um, because you know, and, and it's funny because the DevOps group on Tuesday had this had a conversation about the the disconnect between, and I, th I think we were talking about this on Twitter too, the disconnect from developers just going off and building whatever they thought was the best thing, and thinking about you know the ROI and the manageability and the serviceability and, and, and things like that. And so I think that you know this is this is a classic thing I'm seeing you know we're seeing in Kubernetes uh, conversations too. It's sort of like I yes, using Kubernetes is great for the developer who wants to put Kubernetes on their resume. Is it the is it the is it actually solving business problems and creating a long-term sustainable infrastructure for people? Some some Definitively yes for some people, but maybe not for a lot of the use cases it's been applied to. Lawrence is, is looking at me like you have something to say. But, I, um, I, think, I think you have a valid point. The thing is that the, the, it, it's like the, what's the door which is open to enter easily, you know? So uh, the, I, the, it, accessibility is not there. Um, when I say developers, like we usually talk about, like I always talk about this Gardner's pace layered approach, the systems of record, systems of differentiation, slash systems of um, 
engagement. You can, they are interchangeable names. And then third tier is the systems of innovation. That's where the cloud drug is introduced to people. So um, that's how they get uh, lured into it and then they get addicted. And then they start using that in the other two types of systems that, you know, we always talk about move as is a really bad, you know, thing to do and all that stuff. But skills gravity is more important than data gravity in my view. So if you know certain things, how to do it, you will keep doing it. At the end of the day, people are using the technology. They're consuming the technology, not technology using technology right now so far. So we, we don't have AI making the decisions about like where, where do I put the workload? We do. I, right. I, I think that that's, a, that's a, a reasonable lens. To me, it's one of the things that explains why Terraform is so popular, even though it's not a very, yeah. Terraform is a multi-cloud tool. And, and then I want to transition to the, this grid um, and, and talk about the disaster planning, because I feel like we had a really good warm up for this. And then I want to pull us into the, into what could go wrong in the future and, and please, people, please check to make sure you can link it to the doc. I can share it and put it on the screen too. Hey, Ron, um, what can go yeah. wrong in the future? I mean, you are living in 2020, right? I, I want us <laughs> to get even more creative than 2020 is throwing at us. I like how Rob is so confident there's going to be a future. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. There'll be a future. <laughs> oh. I, I actually, if 2020 isn't teaching us that the status quo is much more vulnerable to disruption, then, right, then we, we, should, we should be thinking about, you know, global supply chains. We should be thinking about, um, you know, how easy it is for that to get disrupted. You know, I, you know, yes. Rob? Even, yeah, go ahead. Looking at your grid? Yep. You want can to start everybody, with can everybody see the grid or should I, should I put it on screen? Where's the link? Can you put the, did you, or did you already I put, put it? I put it in chat, but I'll, I'll redo it. It okay. looks like I fixed, I got the permissions right. So people can. Um, okay. Excellent. Thank you. But I, I can easily either overlay my video on this or um, share it. Just it so might be better to it. share it because there's still the access. You have to request access still. Uh, well, oh, darn it. All right. Maybe I'm, share it. I will fix those as people request. I'm going to fix the sharing and share the screen. So let me do this. Excellent. All was going to say don't change the hardware vendors tabs. and the consulting integrators are easier to talk about. Maybe we should start there. Um, there'll be less debate. What fun is that? <laughs> Let's see. Um, Yep, I messed this up. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Hello. Don't change mine, Rob, because I was logged in. Yeah, you should. You should be. I didn't change anybody. I just made it so okay. new people can can get. Um, and then I'm confirming Slack is letting me do the quick give people rights if you've requested them. <sighs> and Rich Miller is in the house. Exactly right. Um. So, so yeah, the first thing to talk about is, are we getting, are the, so what, I, what I'm trying to do is structure this because what I'm hoping people will do is even if you don't have the floor and the mic, type in the, in the boxes. Um, and so the first thing to do is spend a couple minutes saying, are we getting the, the axes right on this um, without going too overboard, right? You know, plus or minus seven, two plus or minus seven type of thing. So Rob, um, I may have yeah. missed something along the way here and I apologize for missing the last couple of calls due to my move, but um, can you give me a little context to, for the tee up for this? Yeah, oh yeah, sorry. So the, the goal for Cloud 2030 more generally is to talk about where things are going. Um, and one of the things to think through in any talk about the future is what are the big forces that could move the market in unpredictable ways? So, right, we talk about disruption as like a startup coming through and coming up with a new product. And, and we definitely want to talk about that. And we'll break down things like data adjacency and cloud economics and sort of the, the normal, what I would call the normal marketplace. Part of today's goal is to come in and say, these are bigger forces than the innovation um, or than the normal market forces, 
that would potentially upset the whole apple cart. And so the idea here is we, we sort of touched on all these things. Um, we, we actually went about 20 minutes in the last session about this. Um, and even there's some notes from earlier conversations up, up above where we talked about disaster scenarios. And so the idea was to pull through um, some of those big categories and talk about ways that they would impact the, the different vendor classes. Um, and this is where the grid is really too small. I, I would love to see somebody put a sentence in, right? Government regulation about the hyperscalers. We have a question is, you know, will uh, governments break them up as monopolies? Mm -hmm. Right, so, so it, this, this grid's gonna get awfully big. Um, I, I'm actually gonna switch the page to uh, landscape mode and give us a little bit more typing space. Uh, from that perspective. Uh, yay, yay, that was an easy fix. Um, but that's, that's the goal here is to sort of capture these out. And then if we want, we could drill into one or two things that are more specific um, as, as broader. And so what I'm hoping people will do is if you're, if you're filling in a box uh, and you want feedback and conversation on it, Bring it, bring it to the, you know, just talk, just we'll, we'll talk about this. But if you don't have the floor and your something sparks an idea, feel free to type in the boxes. This, you know, sort of dynamic note taking is exactly what I'm thinking because we're not going to, in the next 24 minutes, we're not going to cover all of the topics that I know are running around in people's heads. Certainly not in mine. Well, Tim, does that help? Yes, thank you. Of course. Uh, and can everybody see the full page on this or is it Zoom not updating the share? See it. Looks Zoom. like I'm seeing the full page. Okay, good. Zoom tell, Zoom's lying to me. At the very least, we're seeing the full grid. Awesome. Yeah, there's a green box around it. I, if you were recording or something, screen recording or something, I don't know what that green. Yeah, there's. I, I'm seeing a green line through the middle of the right, the my, rightmost box. We yeah. can see everything then. But good. Yeah, we can see the whole thing. Okay, I'm not gonna keep fighting it then. The um, so. So when you talk about acquisition vendor movement. Yeah. The, uh, I don't really so think this, this is a disruption. There, like, so disruption would be something that. So I'm thinking like where would vendors trying to hold on to status quo fit? That's not really a disruption, but it's a blocker kind of thing. Uh, so I'm going to assume, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume they're going to hold on to status quo. What's what pushes them in a way that gets makes that not work. So for example, um, let's say Intel and AMD um, merge like they're, they're, they're on the ropes, they merge and they, right, we lose, we lose competitiveness in that, in that marketplace. And all of a sudden the chip prices go way up or, um, you know, they're, they're, that, that's what I'm trying, like something that takes, we're, we assume that we're gonna keep pumping out, you know, silicon components the way we have been. Okay. And if, if all of a sudden computer, computer resources became much cheaper or much more expensive, um, that would be a really good example. So if somebody came out with a you know um, super cheap ARM server, there was some breakthrough in, in processing capability, and it became possible to put a system on a chip that was as powerful as you know a regular machine, and um, but it was affordable, so you could drop one in your house. Would that? Can excuse yeah. me, Rob? Go. Where's the link to the document? I'll repost it. it I'll, the, I'll, when you Joe, uh, this is a Zoom thing. You don't see the the the, the chat history. Let's past chat. Oh, okay. Oh, is there a place for it? Is there? Anyway, it's yeah. So I just re, I just reposted. Okay, thanks. Um, and so that's the, that's the type of thing, and so I can go down and describe. Gina, would it be helpful if I if I sort of I'm assuming the vendor class col columns are 
are explanatory enough? Rob, what's not yeah. in the vendor column is the telcos. <clears throat> oh, you are right. That is a major oversight. Thank you. I, I made it a little more general. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, one of the things that we talked would, about in the past is that telcos in other countries are actually government controlled. Would data center providers kind of fit under your network providers and telcos? I would, I, I'm happy to do it there. Yeah, I think so. It's, uh, then I would call, I'll just change, change this to infrastructure providers. So it's, okay. um, yeah, I think that's a good distinction actually. Infrastructure versus infrastructure services like exactly. AWS. Yeah, that's a good one. So let me, since we're on this row, is there a major disruption just in the class of vendors? Right, the telcos haven't become <laughs> cloud service providers. Um, you know, we've, we've been running in these sort of lanes for a long time, right? The hardware companies don't seem to become software companies. Appliances, maybe, I, I don't see appliances as the, as, as, you know, the appliance companies tend to become software companies. That's the way I see it. Um, I mean, it's just, a, it, appliance companies, it's just a means of delivering that kind of service. If, if you were to look at Snowball, and the snowball mm -hmm. class of, of hardware, mm -hmm. does that change these columns? I don't think so because you're, I mean, again, I think it comes back to how do you want to create your classifications? Cause I started putting a couple notes down in the bottom of other considerations. Um, you know, if you're looking at it from a vendor lens, then S snowball becomes just an extension of that cloud to edge continuum, right? You're gonna have other vendors that might be more edge to cloud or data center to cloud, um, and some that are gonna sit somewhere in the middle. So I think I'd be careful not to get hung up on the technology that gets delivered because everybody's doing it slightly differently. Okay, I'm, I, I am gonna, track that in the innovation category. I, th I think there is a vertical integration. Um, yes, I think there is vertical. This. Yeah, th but that's a different dimension, right? So there's vertical integration um, and some of that vertical integration becomes industry specific too. So for example, you have providers and in some cases consumers, enterprises that are in a given vertical like financial services that are actually creating specific technology services for the financial services market for their competition because they realize that they need specificity for their industry but they also need the scale to make it beneficial for everyone so you're there's a can i pull that into the future a little bit because there's this the word scale really stands out to me in this there's this assumption that to provide the services in the future, you have to have a de the, this high degree of scale. And, and it feels to me like one of the arguments in, in like a vertical for financial services is that if you don't, if you're not sufficiently big, then you can't service the market. Is there a chance that we'll, di we'll disrupt that assumption, this, this mega, mega vendor assumption? I think we have. I mean, the reality is that you have just a plethora of long tail vendors in any given space that are successful by any um, measure. You know, just because they may not be a, a $10 billion company doesn't mean that they're not successful. I mean, last time I checked, if you're a $100 million company, that's still pretty darn successful. That goes to what we talked about last week that Tim, you weren't here, I don't believe. Um, we were talking about AWS and how many services it should have. Uh, and basically, AWS should have tons of services so it could meet all its demands. 
but that still gives room, or at least the hypothesis is that there's still room for the best in class companies. I think that's what you were saying. Yeah, so you know, another way to think about it with AWS, and I, I think there are two pieces there to break apart. One is um, they can keep piling on more services, but one of the concerns that I continually hear and have heard for a few years now is just where does the pruning of the portfolio start to come into play for AWS, right? Where they start to say, okay, there are certain services that just don't have the traction and we can't maintain those um, to make them cost effective. And so they start to lock them up. You know, Google does this, but in a very abrupt way. Most companies do this in, in one way or another. But then the second piece is look at AWS. I mean, AWS to a large degree, and we could argue about this, but they're a general purpose cloud provider. I mean, so is Azure, so is Google. They're a general purpose cloud infrastructure provider. And what I mean by that is that when you get to a certain level of specificity, and I think a good example of this might have been the early days of, um, I, can't think of the, I can't think of the name of the company, it starts with a Z, uh, Zynga. So, you know, Zynga started with AWS, but then they realized that they couldn't get the same performance or the performance uh, classifications that they needed. And so they built their own infrastructure. They had the right amount of infrastructure and they needed the specificity to be able to tune their infrastructure accordingly. So they built their own infrastructure. Well, then they ran into financial issues and it didn't make sense for them to do that. And they went back to AWS. My point to this is that I do think you get to a point where you cross a threshold where specificity becomes more important than what you can get from the established providers. And there's a cost effectiveness to do so. But there are a lot of factors that come into that decision. But the challenge there is that with the increasing sophistication of the services they offer, that developers are making a hard choice. That is, if they commit to AWS, they're gonna be using something which is AWS specific and impossible to replicate elsewhere without very substantial work. And so I think that the increasing service portfolio of the majors is an important factor in their longevity in your decision making. That is, it's really difficult to change once you've made a commitment to their services. And the more sophisticated the service, the less likely you, you are to move. Yeah. I think so another- that's, that's it. Well, I think another add-on to that is you have the services that they have sometimes are not, the popular ones sometimes are not AWS services. They are startup services. They're small companies or big companies that run services for people that consume AWS. Um, and those companies are looking for ways to bring those services to um, data centers that are on the ground, um, on-prem data centers. So I, I think there's in addition to being locked in, what about the smaller companies that run on AWS that are looking for ways to come to ground? And that's what Outpost is all about, by the way. Yeah, that's one way to bring those vendors in, in into your own data center, I, I believe. But I, I, I think on that note, I think we need to add openness somewhere on this grid, like with or the ecosystem effect, you know. Uh, um, like which vendors play better uh, to that sort of uh, effect than others? Uh, scale when is another say, one. When you say openness, so and this is uh, we're going to have we're going to have more discussions on open source. Um, <laughs> the, uh, to me, there's there's a ecosystem openness. So we, right, if if you look at the software or hardware vendors on this chart right, and potentially the telcos, they could actually collaborate to build something that had bigger scale than AWS was building if they could figure out how to collaborate. Um, is I, that, that to me is the, the challenge when openness, I guess, let me ask this as a question. Are you implying open source from an openness perspective or collaboration from an openness perspective? When I say openness, that's collaboration, but and, and an open, versus open source is a separate discussion also. It's part of the whole, whole open thing. Op open means like, are you open to business? Means like you, you are um, 
what we used to call ISV friendly or the small companies friendliness that can small companies host their solutions in your car marketplace, for example, how easy it is for vendors to work with you to disperse their technology through your marketplaces because you have the big audience, big market, right? Um, yeah, we, we know which marketplace does the best in cloud, right? Well, well, I think there is an, there's an interesting aspect with regard to retiring services, which is this, that historically people would say a hard disk, you know, you bought it and it was done and you could always buy a new one later. But, you know, there was no assumption that the thing would be supported forever. And mm -hmm. with the adoption of software services, you're always going to have some portion of the population of your customers who are addicted to the old thing. And we haven't at all dealt with how to move people forward. It's just a legacy again. Yeah. And that's, there. that's an important piece, Simon, to this, because, you know, when you think about this from a startup or web scale perspective as a consumer of those services versus enterprise, I mean, enterprise using off the shelf software, um, they tie into those decisions for multiple years. And so they're not accustomed to be able to, to shift and, and make those replacements um, as quickly as they might need to be as you have degradation of services. And so that becomes problematic. I mean, there was a Twitter chat um, or Twitter discussion about this, right? And end of life and, and how things uh, kind of play out. I think one of the, one of the challenges is here is you have to think about the culture too within the enterprise and what's behind some of those decisions. It's not just the decision, but it's what's driving some of those decisions that is really the key there. But I also wanted to mention something about SJ's um, comment about openness is if you go down the path of talking about openness, I think you also have to talk about the network effect because there is something to be said about who else is playing in that pond um, you know, this is, this is kind of the, who was it? Um, you know, Metcalf talked about, a little bit about this, right? Uh, yeah. As part of ethernet, but um, the network effect, I think is a, a key aspect to consider when you talk about openness. I mean, so from that perspective, could we see something, some, you know, some technology or some component, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about TikTok in this case and how fast People assume these networks are very durable, but you could have a new network with a new network effect happen very quickly. It's harder with physical goods because they've got to be produced and sold. But, In the context um, of the network effect, I was wondering this, <clears throat> whether there will be new networks simply because the competitive pressure is so great. That is, I mean, I happen to have a bunch of Twitter followers, but really that's because I joined Twitter early. And ultimately that becomes indefensible um, to new innovative people who are showing up and want to do cool things and who are better than me, right? So they will create new networks. They will attract followers, customers, whatever they are. And it seems to me that's um, inexorable. That is, you know, will we sit with Twitter and Facebook forever? I think, I suspect the answer is no. Right. How fast do you think we could switch off of Twitter? I think it's happening already. <clears throat> I see small groups of things on WhatsApp and whatever else, right? So there are different yeah, ways that even us stuff like networks. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I, think, I think the bigger question is why, and that probably becomes more indicative of how quick things move and where people go. So rather than just looking at the symptoms, which is people are moving off of Twitter or off of a given product and moving to something else, um, understanding the underlying drivers behind that. Yeah, because it's not like we didn't have these networks before. I mean, I was on AIM. There's all sorts of different digital networks we've all been on. So it, it goes to, um, the what is like a really good question. <laughs> like what would it be and why would you move? Like I'm not on TikTok because I do think there's a huge security risk to it. I think it's more manageable on Twitter. 
I'm not on WhatsApp for the same reason because I'm not on Facebook. So um, there's lots of so things to talk about with that. There's an interesting column that we didn't put in here, uh, which is the social. I'm going to add it in the middle. Um, so there's a social. Notifications. Yeah. I don't know, there's probably a better word, but. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, but it's, you know, this is, if you include Facebook in this, it's right, you know, uh, proof of, you know, uh, but people don't seem to care, right? Proof of misuse of data. This goes to the information thing we were talking about earlier with the short bites. People, it's not that people don't care. There's so much information right now that what can you care about? What's the most important thing to care about? And where will you go and listen to a two hour podcast or read something that takes you more than 30 seconds? That's what you yeah. care about. What's what you can pay attention to because there's so much content being thrown at us that you have to be able to, to it, it's not that they don't care, it's that they don't have the, the, the bandwidth and the energy to care. I you think know, people, people assume and it's correct anyway, that their private information is out there <clears throat> and is compromised. And so they're adopting a zero trust approach to the world. And we see it mirrored in other aspects of society, um, distrust and, and, and conflict and so on. Um, but I think that this <clears throat> The challenge that we have is that people go about well, go about their their lives in a zero trust approach, um, and we haven't get, really dealt with that as a bunch of humans before. Well, the, the, there's also the the I, I wouldn't call it zero trust, uh, but beyond that, uh, again, going back to the caring not caring thing. Um, it, I, I think you hit the point that, that people assume that their, informa their private information is already out there. Uh, there seems to be a divide in reaction, however. There is the tech savvy community, and uh, I would say it's most likely uh, us who, uh, who, who are going into basically uh, like dam damage mitigation mode and say, okay, work, how can I limit future private information from being uh, made public. And then there's the, the naive approach, which I, I, I've heard way too many times uh, from people who continue to using TikTok or, or WhatsApp. And, and that's basically, well, my information is already out there, so I might as well continue engaging in, in, in risky behavior with regards to privacy uh, because there's nothing I can do about it. So it, it might be, again, that, that the lack of tech savviness leads to a hopelessness about data mm -hmm. protection. And as a result of that, uh, risky behavior. Yeah, spot on. I think you have good points there. I, I, I believe as soon as we start intermingling B2C with B2B, uh, the discussions get muddy. You know, like when, when we come talk with cloud, and data sovereignty, I can never say that word right. So the data has to stay where it belongs in those countries for those citizens. So I think B2C is more politicized. Um, when we talk about you know Trump talking or somebody in India, Modi talking or somebody else in China talking, so like they don't want their citizens' data going anywhere else. I think they usually talk about B2C and B2B agreements are made behind the scenes and enforced that way internationally and that there are different constructs defined to handle that, I think. I think as soon as we start intermingling these, like these discussions get muddy and then we, our I thinking gets agree fuzzy. to extent, just in, but in terms of data sharing, which is related to the privacy issues, B2B companies say they want to share, share and be open with the data, but when push comes to shove, they don't actually do that. And that's uh, my experience from uh, monitoring, uh, talking to open, aid, open data advocates for the last 15 years. So um, it, it's, there is, what I'm saying is that there is more that they have in common, B2C, B2B, than they have not in common. Uh, yeah, that, that, is, that is true. Behind the scenes, it's, it's data and, and bits and like how do they share and it, at some point it becomes B2B to C 
kind of thing, right? So, but at the same time, I think um, like what you get for free as a citizen is different than when you pay for something and you're using that. I think those are different things. And you have more say in things when you pay for something than when you don't. Right? You're, you're mute, you're mute, Rob. Thanks. I, I, I don't know that you do have more say. I, I feel like people's ability to vote with their feet um, has been very limited. It has been taken away. The, well, but it's, uh, there's, there's layers of, of what the problems are, right? If that was the case, then, then we'd actually have real, like you, you wouldn't have these click through um, privacy waivers that uh, drive everything, drive everything else. Um, we're at the top of the hour. I don't have a, a specific topic for next week. I did talk to McCrory about coming in for data gravity. And I know we had some people who want to talk about cloud economics and adjacency. Rich, would you do cloud economics next Thursday? Can you do that? I I, I can't be prepared for it next next week. It's just, okay. I've got can, too much on my plate right now. I no worries. Can I put you down for two weeks, or do you want to just look at look at your calendar? That would see? make that would make more sense. Okay, I will do I will do that for you. I'm going to arm twist McCrory in and uh, and I. Rather than cloud economics, I'd, I'd actually think of it more about data economics. But okay. I've got to run. Sorry, folks, and thank this you. Was great. This is great. Aha, it's of my week. Ah, thank you. I appreciate your contributions. See you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, you know, thanks. Appreciate it. from an organizational perspective. And then logistics, um, what I'm hoping is when people uh, volunteer to take uh, a session, just schedule it in that list. You, can, you should be able to add your own event. So if you're taking over a Thursday morning session and driving the agenda, just put, your, put the agenda in, uh, take whatever you know, slot is available or predictable, and go from there, I'm trying to get out of the Scheduling. I'll, I'll write that down in the events list so people know what to do. What's that, the URL, Rob? Events.the2030.cloud. It's also that you can click to it from the site with, under events. Let me double check, make sure I'm not crazy. Yeah. Clear as mud. Or the sky in the Bay Area. <laughs> <laughs> that is not an encouraging sign. That means the it's not sky only. The Bay Area makes some great photo opportunities, aside from the fact that we're killing the Earth. But that's okay. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it's and not it's, working, Rob. And it's because of the fires. Is that what it is? And just the way everything's blowing? And... Uh, sorry. And do you have any rain mostly. <clears throat> There's yeah. All right. I'll keep working on it. Damn it. We had an, er we had an, earth we had an earthquake over here in, in Jersey. Oh yeah, that's, that's right. So and that Did doesn't you even make the news. <laughs> nope. 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 Had a tornado the the other week. Took out the took out a the kids section of the hospital. You're on the Jersey coast. Oh, I'm no. over in uh, along the Delaware, uh, in between Philly and New York. Bucks County. Yep. Yeah, the uh, Doylestown Hospital took a hit, Tim. Oh, it, uh, gotcha. Something like something like twelve cars were flipped over. Oh. Just missed it. It literally just missed my friend's house when it came through. It was a EF two, I think it was, and it just missed my friend's house by one yard. Oh my god! Yeah, he's got math. It's one of those houses with the with the massive trees that have been around forever. And when they come down, I mean, it's thousands. It's thousands just to get them removed. If they're old trees, um, the the wood from them can be quite valuable. So mm -hmm. you might be able to to make a deal with an arborist to. Uh, to trade it. I'm in the market for yeah. a table. W well, one so one of the one of the world's master woodworkers is okay. I ride by his house all the time or 
former house. Uh, his kids run it now. Uh, George Nakashima. Uh, so all the wood, all that wood comes from here. Uh, so if you ever hear a Nakashima uh, uh, furniture, that's all around this area. It's a really weird area. A lot of Broadway stars, a lot of movie stars in the middle of nowhere. Is well, there's a lot of commuters that go from Bucks County up to uh, Manhattan. I mean, I know, Mike, you know this, but my closest friend lives in Bucks County, not far from Mike, and um, commutes into this, well, used to commute into the city. Yeah, it's, it's, this, weird, and it's this weird technical, like technology bedroom community. Um, Chip Childers mm-hmm. from Cloud Foundry lives down the street from me. Um, who else? Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, Chip's, Chip's here. Al, Gil, Al Gillen's here. Um, Al's there. Oh. Yep. Yeah, Al lives up on this farm in the middle, more in the middle of nowhere than anybody up by Tinicum, a little okay. bit north. Uh, Joe, McKendri- Joe McKendrick's here. Ned Bellavance. Like, we're all in this within five miles oh, wow. of each other. It's re- really weird. And, and somebody has this red sports car with Linux plates on it, with personalized Linux plates <laughs> on it. I got behind him. I have it somewhere in my files. I have a picture of it because I grabbed a, an old cell phone uh, pick of him. Of course, I look like a stalker following him. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm in New York. My I have Linux plates. It was probably you. You're probably down on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Where in New York it, are you? Is it, city? Um, I'm actually in... Uh, my office is in one of my offices in Melville, so I'm right here right now. I got all my infrastructure here for the rack and stuff, so uh, I'm looking forward <laughs> to get that stuff in there. Awesome. I love it. Mike, I don't know if you remember Scott Sanchez. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Scott used to live in Bucks County, too, and in fact, he and I first met at the, it wasn't, it's not called, is it Cozy? Um, yeah. It's like a little bakery place in Newtown. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, this uh, it's, it's and then we got Dead Anson who runs a runs a uh, an a and a uh, virtual reality uh, dev shop here that's done a ton of work uh, with a lot of the hospitals and on the enterprise side. There's that's as much as I as much as I like to knock a lot of that consumer level stuff. The uh, the enterprises real and infrastructure really play really does a lot of work in the uh you know ar and vr stuff a lot of value there just never nobody ever talks about it so let's not talk about it (laughs) (laughs) i actually you know we hadn't thought about doing a uh ar vr session yet but i would i would love to do that uh, from that perspective All right, SJ's here, so we can stop talking about it. We can we can just give it up. Good morning, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, morning, SJ. I, Good morning. What's up? Uh, we're just we're hanging for another couple minutes before we dive into uh, talking about what whatever could go wrong, and we'll write this down and see if things like the sky turning red and um, you know some of you know snow and fire on the same day. Ever, you know, can cross into our uh, disaster planning scenarios if we're creative enough. Um, How about the, the 50s uh, in August is pretty crazy. disaster to me. <laughs> what, <are you laughs> at, what the heck? <laughs> well, look at Denver. It went from 90s to snow in less yeah. than 24 hours. And a lot of snow. My friend Chip sent me a picture of his backyard, his deck and everything. It's not a little. It was more than a dusting. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's lot to think about. I, I did have an interesting uh, question for y'all from a warm-up uh, thought perspective. The um, uh, One of the people, if, if you don't know Tricia uh, Howard, she's been doing these dynamic dramatic readings of uh, sales. You, Gina's knows she's laughing. Um, of, okay. of, cold, of cold sales calls. So she's reading them and it, they're, they're actually pretty funny. If you have some that you think are funny, you should send them to her. Um, Trisha kicks ass on um, SAAS on uh, Twitter, but um, what what would people want to see read dramatically? Um, <laughs> that was my warm up. My warm up question is what what would somebody want to see read dramatically from our 
our our space i don't know god csp vendor pitches i don't know like she reads reads pitches uh or or these linkedin invitations and stuff like that in a funny way i think they're really funny yeah yeah i i mean there's a press releases there's a uh I, I could see, uh, I mean, cause like last week we were talking about the song with Amazon services. So it made me think of it. It's like, Oh, we need some more. It know, would be cloud. funny to do like a claymation of the arguments. Maybe it's not a dramatic reading, but like a claymation <laughs> wrestling fight of some of the you know, different vendor arguments. For <laughs> You're thinking like, you like celebrity death match. <laughs> Something oh. like that would be funny. When this first started, I thought about doing late night versions of that with with companies docs as a sort of ASMR go to sleep music. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> oh my god! Feels nice like little a, na- nature nature sounds as a bed in the back. <laughs> feels oh like my a, god, that'd be so good. <laughs> A bad SNL skit, you know, like uh, Deep Thoughts with Jack Handy, you know, <laughs> goes tech. <laughs> Boring Docs with Mike Maney. <laughs> that would be so good, Mike. That's such a good Jack idea. You, you, have, and you have the voice. You could do it. Get your the the hard part is when it gets to, when, you know, when there's code dropped into it. <laughs> and I'll just spell it. You can just spell it out at that point, though. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do some analytics like where is the point where people drop off and fall asleep because that's when you want to put that part <laughs> read that part <laughs> new line i think, I think i'm gonna brace, do it left curly brace yeah i would do it you should do at that's least one it would be SMR. so funny be really good. <laughs> i wonder if you could do um you know this is now we're approaching sarah cooper stuff like uh reading reading a tweet back and forth but I was, uh, 